Chris Alexander, welcome to Global Brief Studio. Thanks very much, Irvin. Listen, Chris, you've written a wonderful piece for Issue 2, uh, Global Brief, and you're back in Canada, uh, back from a tour of duty in Kabul as Deputy Special Representative for the UN Secretary General in Kabul. Um, tell us about uh, the state of play in Afghanistan. What is the state of play on the ground? The situation is difficult. As, as uh, always, almost, in Afghanistan, things are hanging by several threads, and we have to make them stronger. One is the second round of voting, which is coming up in uh, a week's time. Um, a big test for Afghanistan, because we only have a second round because of a very controversial process, which resulted in many fraudulent votes being thrown out. And a lot of donors, and Afghans, quite frankly, won't make up their minds about what their next commitments will be until after those elections. Mm -hmm. Chris, let's, uh, let's just look at, at the future five years, 10 years. Um, that is the orientation of Global Brief. What is success, if we can put it that way, in, in Afghanistan? Success, I think, would be a cresting of the insurgency, uh, an end to the growth that we've seen, intensification that we've seen, and a beginning of its uh, gradual uh, elimination from Afghan life, and growing stability. Uh, stability that needs to be underpinned by three things, a stronger economy, stronger institutions, uh, and obviously a security system that works. So what's failure, if, if that's the barometer of success, what's failure in Afghanistan five to ten years hence? To be honest, I think failure is um, more tangibly uh, described as something that's more likely to happen on the moral plane than actually on the ground. If the international community, in all of its uh, forms, uh, loses the will, the determination, to follow through with what it's done in Afghanistan, to finish the job, uh, then I th think we can see drift of various kinds in Afghanistan uh, and a return to the conflict of the last 30 years, but probably in a different form. Are, are we interested in stabilizing Afghanistan, qua Afghanistan, or is, is, it, is it a more uh, reduced interest as to, to securing the West or securing the so-called developed world from, from exportable forces in Afghanistan? Well, this is, this is probably the heart of the debate right now, Irvin. Um, since 2001, the classic description of what we're doing has been to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a haven, a platform for terrorists ever again. Uh, that's a fairly limited objective. But we've learned along the way that to achieve that objective, we need an Afghanistan that is stable, that has institutions, that is capable of managing its own affairs, standing on its own feet. Uh, some call that mission creep. Uh, I would call that realism, and it leads us very quickly to the regional dimension. Uh, South Asia, Central Asia are uh, regions that have been contested for centuries to some extent, certainly in the 20th century. Uh, and part of the challenge in Afghanistan is putting that region on a path towards greater stability, towards greater in e economic integration that will pay huge benefits both for Asia and the rest of the world. No, no, that's great. W let's talk about that regional dynamic because Pakistan seems to be the, the huge wild card here. What is happening in Pakistan? What is the role of Pakistan? And can we throw a little bit of analysis in, on the Indian role as well, which is also underplayed here? Well, Pakistan played this fundamental role as the vehicle for um, Western support for a jihad, for mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Uh, and ever since that uh, jihad took place, Pakistan has been intimately involved in the affairs of Afghanistan through the factional groups that it supported. Uh, the Taliban is one of those groups. Has Pakistani support for the Taliban ended? Probably not. Uh, is the current operation in South Waziristan directed against the K Taliban? Definitely. Uh, but these are deep waters, and I wouldn't say there's yet an unambiguous Pakistani policy towards the Taliban. Um, and that's partly because there's a perception in Islamabad, Rawalpindi, and elsewhere that Indian influence in Afghanistan after 2001 has grown. Uh, so there is uh, a, a regional dimension to this conflict. Uh, the interests of India, Pakistan, and other neighbors need to be balanced inside Af Afghanistan. Afghans are going to be the best at doing that. But we have to take those dynamics fully into account. And I think um, we've only started to look at these issues seriously in the past year. Uh, they're fundamental to any resolution. What, what, 
second last question, what's the Indian interest in Afghanistan? Well, um, India sees a deep historic tie to Afghanistan and Central Asia. The Mughals came from there. Um, trade, cultural links have always been strong, as Pakistan sees those links. Um, but there are schools of thought in both countries that see it as a zero-sum game. If India has influence, say, in President Karzai's current cabinet, Dr. Abdullah, his family lives in India, for example, then that m must mean that um, Karzai and company are hostile to Pakistan's interest, or so some in Islamabad would mm. say, and vice versa. Mm. Uh, when one speaks about certain other players in the Afghan political scene, in fact, it's not a zero-sum game. And both India and Pakistan uh, should have influence, should have strong trading relations with Afghanistan. Uh, but creating a sense of confidence deep enough for both sides to see mutual advantage from uh, being involved together multilaterally in Afghanistan is still a long way off. It's a long way off. However, you do, Chris, uh, paint a rather not pessimistic uh, picture of, of uh, possible Afghan futures in your in your piece, which is quite original, I find. Let's uh, just close um, in, uh, with the global question we ask in this issue of Global Brief. Who's to lead? What's to be done? And, and, and do you think we can do something? Definitely. Um, there are three major tasks in Afghanistan today. One is prosecuting counterinsurgency successfully. That means having enough troops, principally Afghan military forces, police forces on the ground to make communities feel safe. Uh, but it also means dealing with the remaining sanctuaries in Pakistan. And that dialogue is now sharper, uh, mm. more substantial than it was before. The second agenda item is building institutions in Afghanistan. Mm. Here the UN has an extremely important role to play, together with the major donors, mm. the US, Europeans, Canada as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, there is uh, an imperative to unlock this economic potential of the region. And here the regional players, uh, SARC, the Economic Cooperation Organization, the SCO to the north, uh, each have their agendas, but agendas that are much more um, coherent, overlapping, than is generally credited. Mm -hmm. uh, and they need to be brought together, probably with the help of the UN, uh, to, to put meat on those regional uh, economic integration bones. Chris, thanks for being uh, here at Global Brief Studios, and thanks for your piece. Much success to you. Thanks very much, Thanks Irvin. very much.